Having you here, Alanis Morissette. This is exciting and it's a great, great, great honor for us, for the whole DLD team and for the whole audience. The room is packed as never before and it's for good reason. Alanis Morissette, you're one I have to read, you know, the official part. You're one of the most successful singer-songwriters. You won 16 Juno Awards, seven Grammy Awards. You were nominated for two Golden Globe Awards and also shortlisted for an Academy Award. She's an actress too, but that was for a song you wrote. Uh, you won the MTV uh, Europe Music Award, the Brit Award, two times the Echo Award. Her, your debut album, Jag Little Pill, was the best-selling debut album of uh, a female artist of history. Um, and what can I say? I want to have you up on stage and talk to you, Alanis. We're so proud to have you here. Welcome, Alanis Morissette! Hello. Oh, hello. The spontaneity of it all. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Please, Lennis, tell me first of all what brings you to Germany. You're just coming in from Berlin. Yes. Where you're doing uh, a video, recorded a video. Yes. Tell us about it. Well, the last song you heard three seconds of just there, we shot it in Berlin yesterday, the video for it. Um, it's a tribute to the Wim Wenders movie. It's 25 years of Wings of Desire, so we shot a video. Tipping the hat to that beautiful art piece, and um, I'm speaking in tongues now because we didn't have much sleep last night, so forgive me. No, no, I was absolutely, I'm happy. <laughs> you won't realize my bad English so much. Uh, and at the same time, you're on tour as well. You're already on tour with your new album. Yes. As well with, of course, the old things, and you have a huge catalog. Uh, havoc and bright light. I had to look up the word havoc. I don't know if everybody knows what it is. It's, it's destruction, it's chaos, it's... Darkness, the dark side. Why that title? I've been obsessed with wholeness my whole life, so I'm obsessed with the dark and the light and the challenging and the very easy. Just I think it's part of the human condition to be this bothness, and I'm a Gemini, so havoc is more of the challenging, difficult, you know, a recovery from some addictions. One of which is work addiction, which is part of why I haven't slept. And then the other side of Bright Lights is really focusing on the exaltation and the joy and the sensual pleasure that it is to be a human being. So, and then the sense of spirit that permeates everything that I write about and speak about. So wanting to touch on as much as possible in a short title. What is your Bright Light moment? Is it now connected more than ever with your son? Or is it the moment you stand on stage? Or is it the moment you've just finished a good song? When is it? That's a great question. I think it's a combination of the micro, which is that sort of delicate, intimate, um, microcosmic interaction with my son or my husband or my best friends, with you right here, and then, and then the macro version, you know, living my vocation and living my purpose and being in the public eye. Because uh, speaking of your son, um, Ever, okay. why Ever, by the way? I don't know, it just Come came on, through. Come on, you've chosen the name. <laughs> yeah, it just came through one day and I ran it up the flagpole with my husband and some of my friends and they loved it. And I loved it, so I didn't really question it. Is it a it. name that existed before, ever? Um, I think there were a handful of evers around yeah? the world. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, anyway, in 2008, so you gave birth to ever and right after the birth of your son, you felt the urge to produce a new album. And this is quite interesting because usually you know, people tend to say that uh, women, especially when they are, you know, giving birth, they've done the most creative, fabulous thing they can do on earth. And this is the very reason, if you would talk to my husband, he would say, well, this is the very reason why women are not so driven and accomplishing big things, because they have this creative ability of becoming a mother. But you, right after delivering your first child, you, you yeah. said, I have to transform my flat into a studio and you started recording day and night and same time being with your son 24 seven. How could yeah. that be? Well, I think there are different, you know, first of all, I think women are built to do the ultimate act of creativity, which is have the potential to create babies, although we don't all do it, but that is a miracle and I agree with your husband. <laughs> and then in the same breath, for me, I, I happen to be this archetype in the kind of animal that wants to serve and whether I, whether I like it or not, you know, it's really, it feels like my calling. So. 
when I don't write and when I don't express myself, I wind up feeling uh, very depressed very quickly. So I need to be responsible to keep that energy moving in the form that is suitable for me, which is to write songs and write articles and to speak like this and to be out there. It's wonderful to speak with you. I wonder who has the highest heels on today. Um, probably you. <laughs> really? <laughs> Mine stay on for 20 minutes. <laughs> Then You're it's just running <laughs> shoes. <laughs> I've got other shoes too, sneakers in the car, right? <laughs> If they only knew the outfits we change into. <laughs> you were talking, you just mentioned that nice word, important word for an artist. The way you see it is servicing. You're a servicing ser artist and serviceness. Yeah. Yeah. How, do, how do you see this? Whom are you serving in? Is it coming through you, or how, what is the concept? Yeah, the act of expression for me is my showing up. So it's a combination of showing up with confidence and energy. It's effortful in that way, but there's an effortlessness in that I just surrender and let, and let it come through. So in a sense, it's channeling without getting too precious about it, but it is my letting go enough to hear the message. And if I can have a credo at all, it would be my job is to listen and heed. You know, if I can Listen get, and? Heed. He. So do what I'm told from the, the from messages. From where? Are, well, for me, it's my own personal connection with spirit. You know, So for everyone, it shows up in different forms. But for me, I just hear a little voice that says, it's time to write, or say no to this, or show up, or go to sleep, <laughs> whatever the message is. So you're hearing voices. Interesting. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, but it's so very this important. Is, this is like, is it a concept of God, of divine showing through you so you're just a channel and you're bringing things to the audience or what um yeah i don't i don't want to get too heavy-handed about it but that's a version of it exactly and i think what's re-emerging in the context of patriarchy as it's segueing out of sort of a, an old school somewhat you know on an extreme level the misogyny and and um you know chauvinism in some ways the new divine feminine is emerging you know so rather than seeing god in an old in an old way, in, a, in an old paradigm, I think the new divine feminine is this surrender and receptivity and openness and um, this real courage to be able to hear, you know, what our own personal unique calling is and whether we call it intuition, whether we call it our gut, whether we call it a prayerful response, whatever we want to call it, it doesn't really matter. You just mentioned the word uh, personal. Actually, what you, your songs are extremely personal. You're writing a journal every day, Every day? He, on the plane here. <laughs> all the time. Yeah, yeah, all the time. Like, I heard that like for one song you might need four journals <laughs> to fill them up and then you come in the studio with a, with a sentence or just a sound and in your journals you write of course there's no censor, right? No censor. There's no, and you go to the most vulnerable places and this is exactly what you're then willing to put into your songs. What, what makes you so brave? I mean it needs a lot of courage to expose and you say that you, The songs you want to write is exactly you go where it hurts the most. Yeah, I mean, holy! I mean, we're all about you know protecting ourselves, but of course, an artist flips this around. And but where do you get the courage? How, how can you do this? Well, I think it takes courage to apply what I write about and the place from which I write to my day-to-day -day life. So that's been my spiritual and psychological practice for the last 25 years has been to take that courage and lack of censorship. I mean, there's appropriate censorship for socialization and consideration, but to take that courage and apply it to speak directly with the people I love and to allow myself to feel feelings like anger and uh, sadness and all of these feelings that we're told not to feel when we're being conditioned, when we're being brought up. You know, there's certain emotions like joy sometimes you know, and being demure, and there's a lot of messages that were sent, not only as humans, but certainly as women, of how we're to present ourselves. But what it does is it, it, it asks of us to cut half of who we are off. And so as an artist, I'm here to continue relentlessly, really, to present um, the whole breadth of what I think humanity is asking of me as a human, and, and certainly for me to present it publicly. So, so is it like you're kind of a midwife for the audience for their feelings, you help them to connect to this aspect of themselves and... Yeah, that's the invitation, you know, that's people may not take me up on it and they don't, certainly don't have to, but, but for me it's, it's about um, sort of healing the rupture of the three relationships. The one I have with my own self, the one I have with spirit, and then the one I have with everyone around me. So my son, my husband, my friends, nature, animals, you know, every relationship is very sacred to me.
Is it then at the end, is it a healing experience when you expose yourself with such a traumatizing event in your life? You ought to, you ought to know and things like that. And when you, when you sing it on stage, mm -hmm. is it a healing experience? Do you think after it's okay, I've gone through it, done, over, I feel better now? I think an important distinction that I've come to over the last two years specifically is that the writing and the, the creativity or the art as such allows for catharsis and a therapeutic movement of energy which can pull me out of despondency and it's valuable in moving that energy but it actually isn't healing. It's when I take that courage and apply it to my relationships that the healing occurs because the theory is that the, the trauma happened in relationship and therefore the healing can happen in relationship and for me the greatest share of healing happens with commitment Commitment and intimacy is commensurate to the degree of healing available. So in my marriage, in my friendships that I see being long-term, my professional commitments, there's a lot of healing available in those. That's great what you say, to understand that healing happens in relationship and not in the, in the artistic expression. Yeah. I wish it would. Very... You know, I, I wanted to run I, away and write all uh, my songs, but it didn't yeah. work. <laughs> <laughs> About your relationships, I... Uh, uh... You had a one, I have found a wonderful quote from you saying, you love, is it the English the right word, serviceness, but in the driver's seat? I think this is a fabulous expression for the modern woman. We love to service and to mm. some point, but being in the driver's seat. Yeah, and I think a lot of us are alpha women, and for a long time we'd be burned at the stake, or we'd have our heads chopped off for being alpha. And I think one of the beauties of evolution right now is that women are being supported and loved for being in this alpha position and that we can work with other alpha men, that there's beta roles that are available for us that can help us serve our mission and that we don't have to have shame for that. We're not going to be killed for it now. And not only are we going to be tolerated, but we might even be supported and you know catalyzed to do even more of what we were born to do. And I feel far less shame even five years along now than I did five years ago for that. I mean, this room obviously is certainly full of alpha women. And uh, <laughs> you're going to be you okay. Say, you're safe. <laughs> keep you, going. Keep going. Definitely, definitely. This is what we're here for. We need really to yeah. keep going and to encourage each other, empower yeah. each other. Yeah. But on the other hand, you said, okay, you, you're so happy about what women empowerment, women, women movement brought us, and all these alpha women are able to express this themselves. But as well, you said that this has led us to a kind of a steeliness. Mm -hmm. and, and that in your period of your life, you're going back more to a more connected, vulnerable, uh, feminine yeah. part of yourself. How would you describe it? Because I think this is such an interesting issue. It's exciting. Yeah, thanks for bringing it up. Um, I think for a while, the patriarchy was such, that, you know, a lot of men went to war and women stepped in and they said, okay, we're going to do everything men can do. We're going to do it better. And it, it sort of kick-started this whole feminist movement, but it, it created this, this idea of autonomy and individualism, which was empowering in some sense and certainly an important link in the chain, but it was a means to an end. It wasn't the end. It didn't afford for intimacy and connection, which I think women are born to foster and nurture. So I think part of what's exciting about evolution right now as well is that we're moving into um, more of a connective, empowered version of ourselves, an authentic version of ourselves that affords this version of connection that we're biologically born to do, um, but also including this independence. So it's more about interdependence now, whereas before perhaps in the patriarchal context, of days of old, let's say, happily, um, the, the context was such that we were, we were dependent, you know, by the very nature of how the whole system was set up. Then we segued into being independent, fierce, burn our bras, which was lovely and so important, so grateful for that movement of my foremothers. And now we're moving into this interdependence where we're no longer um, hated for being who we are, we're being loved for it, we're able to connect, and we're able to say, I actually need you. I need you and you need me and that's okay. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's beautiful. It's exciting. <laughs> um, is there, I mean, it's a women's conference, is there, now that you quoted this, um, is there anything that you see that's deferring men from women? Is there any aspect the feminine, the women bring in that men don't have, or you say, at the end of the day, it's, it's the same. I think we're built incredibly differently, and I think the most important thing is to set up every man in your life to win, and to allow them to protect you and to provide, 
but knowing that in today's context in 2012 and onward, that what they provide is different than what they may have provided in days of old where they would bring home the veggie bacon. So what do they provide today? <laughs> tell me. You tell me. You know, every, every marriage is different. You know? So in my marriage, what my husband provides is right now he's with my son. And I couldn't be here speaking if he weren't with my son. So that's a huge provision. Yeah. Um, he provides support and um, brainstorming and uh, love, intimacy, connection. He provides, I can't even tell you how many things he provides. Perhaps I'll write it on my website. I'll just have a long <laughs> scroll. But there's so much provision. Write it in a song, Alanis. Yeah, and I have <laughs> a, a, a love song for him called Till You, which is the whole lead up to my finally meeting him. But really, all that to say in one sentence is that men are providing constantly and to reward them and, and not reward them but thank them really for that and letting us know that in today's context it might not be in the form of money although it still does show up in that form um, for us beta women but for us alpha women you know different forms of provision now and we need to but thank it's not them. always easy for the men to switch into this new position yeah to we have to be grateful because they look to us, that we're the source of love and empowerment and God in their lives. So if we're disappointed in them and they seem inadequate in our eyes, it's very disempowering for them. But if we're bowing so down and we're saying, thank you, I need you, and this is the form that, that your love is taking that is touching my heart the most, then I think they'll be pretty happy. Well, let's say thank you to all the men. That's true. That's true. You, in, in this album you, you made right after the birth of Ever, uh, uh, Flowers of Entanglement, there's one, no, 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 Guardian is from your last album. No, Guardian's from this one. From this one. From <laughs> so this many album. songs, so little time. Right. And um, you said once that you, you had a moment in your life where you were not taking care of yourself properly, that you were not guarding yourself enough. What, what happened and how did you realize? Did you get to a point of a burnout and, and or how did you change your life, making more, taking more respect of what you called as well, taking yeah. care of your inner child, which I think is an interesting aspect. Yeah, thanks. Um, the course in Guardian is about my protectorship of, of my son Ever's safety and freedom. It's a combination, as I think any mom would know. It's trying to protect the essential self and the physical, spiritual, emotional safety which is no small task. Um, and at the same time, while I was loving him in this way, I could see that I, that I might benefit from loving my own inner child in that way. So that was the first step for me in that regard. But at the same time, being an attachment mom, it's a really big commitment. And I really did have to forego some of my own tending and my own self-care as such in order to provide him what I've been providing him for the last year and a half. And, and I had to be okay with the fact that coffee became my new best friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A little sleep then, right? Less sleep, more gravelly voice, but I think it's worth it. Just talking about the inner child, is the inner child is often often related to creativity, to the very source of yeah, creativity nice. that you have to connect mm. to your own inner child to find your creative source. Is that yeah. the way you conceive it? or? Yeah, that's exactly it. And I think why I love performing this song, Guardian, is because when I'm offering this kind of mama bear, protector, care, compassion, it's toward you know, the inner child slash artist, the authentic self, that core self, while being really tender with the wounded, constructed self that we've built to survive. You know, there's these survival strategies that have kept us alive. Grateful for them, but I like, I like the idea of digging deeper to that core. Does an artist, to be an artist, need to have big wounds he can share with the public? I don't know of any artists that are in the white hot heat that aren't profoundly traumatized and trying to work through it like a phoenix rising. Um, but I don't think that, that the energy of uh, pain and trauma is the only incentivizing, incentivizing force. I think, for me, passion. So passion uh, on behalf of a cause. You know, there are a lot of beautiful songs written in the 60s and 70s about activism and commentary, social political commentary. Anytime there's passion, anger and love are two of the biggest ones for me. So I can, I can write some very feisty, passionate love songs. But I don't think you have to be suicidal to continue to be an artist. <laughs> no, it's so, when, I, when you're sitting here and you're such a gentle, lovely, wonderful person, and in some, in some of your songs there's a lot of anger, mm -hmm. and your voice gets like really steely, and, mm -hmm. and I went, whoa. So mm -hmm. this is something you can like plug in and bring yeah. out. There is some anger. 
right there in Alanis that she yeah. can. Yeah, I think any woman can can attest to the fact whether we have a sort of functional relationship with our anger is another conversation because we have lived in a context and a culture and a climate that says women are not allowed to be angry. They might get killed. They might get hit. There might be retaliation. There might be conflict that they don't want to deal with. They might be abandoned. There's so many messages about why anger is dangerous for us, but we live in a different time now. So if we can counter that animal part of ourselves that is trying to survive by not being angry, I think there's a lot of passion and a lot of art and a lot of um, cultural movement that is available to us if we're cour courageous enough. I can uh, totally agree with that because uh, I've seen very often as well in workshop with other actresses uh, how difficult it is for us women to get in contact with our anger because mm. it is so not okay. We're supposed yes. to be the girls and be nice and come yes. on and don't be... We yes. go into crying, into mm -hmm. sadness, hysteria maybe, but yes. anger, right. clear, Direct. Anger, direct yes. anger is yeah. something that we're so, that through society, through our education yeah. has been so much pushed down. Yeah. And what do you give us to pff, yeah. bring it back up? Well, we're also not told that anger can actually create intimacy. And we are connected. Intimacy? Yes. Because when I don't express my anger, even in my marriage or my friendship, I'm snipping intimacy because I'm not being authentic. And intimacy implies that I'm sharing who my, I know myself to be and someone is sharing who they know themselves to be. So if I'm hiding what I'm angry about from the people I love, I am killing the intimacy. So that's something that we're not told. Mm -hmm. Very true. And we're also shown a version of anger that is very destructive. You know, some of us have been traumatized by anger in our youth, and I think it's the form that anger took. And I think when anger is repressed, it can be very destructive and very physically harming in some cases. And we connotate anger with that action. But anger in and of itself is simply a life force, same as love. Absolutely right, I totally yeah. agree. Uh, let's go swing back to creativity for a moment. Uh, when you, for instance, when you uh, recorded Jack Diddle Pill, you did it in a very small little room that was heated. Uh, happy <laughs> to hear that. But like, did I get it right that it took you like 20 minutes to write one song? That you go straight into the studio without not knowing what you're gonna do? You may bring a sentence or a color, right? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And off you go, <laughs> mm -hmm. you, you never have the panic of the blank page and no, no words is coming, no sound, nothing? Well, I think a blank page means that maybe it might be better to go watch a movie or make a sandwich. <laughs> um, well, so if, if there's nothing coming, then go take a bath. You know, to me, I don't... Well, it I happens don't, to you, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. It just means I don't want to write. <laughs> okay. So if there's something to say, there will be an opportunity to say it. And journals are really great for me because at four in the morning or, you know, while I'm, while I'm jumping out of the shower, I'll think of an idea or a sentence or a conversation that I'd like to engage in through a song. And that song, or that sentence rather, will kickstart a song. And then other times I'll just sit there and, and listen to those voices we spoke of earlier. <laughs> yeah, but what happens, what do you do in the moment where, okay, you have a sentence, you sit there, the studio is there, everybody's waiting to record something, mm -hmm. and nothing is coming? Oh, you said... Sandwich time. <laughs> sandwich time. <laughs> um, <laughs> they already have the sandwich ready. They yeah. come in and say, relax, yeah. let's go for a walk. Exactly. There have been countless... So you're totally relaxed about it. I think this yeah. is the most scary moment for an artist, is the blank page moment, or as an actress, whatever, is this moment yeah. of non-connectedness. Isn't that a scary moment? You seem to, oh, it's so easy, take a bath. It's well, I would say there's, t there's two antidotes or two, two responses to that. One would be collaboration's lovely. So I think curiosity is a quality that can really kickstart creativity. Someone simply saying, what's going on with you? What are you angry about? What are you happy about? What's going on in your life? What do you see out in the world that bothers you? You know, and that can start a conversation. And to me, writing songs is really just a conversation with music. So, so that's that aspect of it. And then um, I also think sometimes people um, aren't necessarily meant to write in that moment. Maybe they're meant to paint, maybe they're meant to dance, maybe they're meant to curl their hair, maybe they're meant to you know, garden for 10 minutes. Just the form having to take uh, a, you know, the form of a song or the form of a poem. Let's not beat ourselves up. Sometimes when I don't want to write songs, I want to go try on a cool pair of shoes, and that's a form of expression, too. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you express by buying these shoes, Alanis? <laughs> I think 
Sex and rock and roll. Sex and rock and roll. <laughs> Got it. I mean, uh, appropriately, yeah. of course. Uh, you, do, do you meditate? Um, I don't do it as often, but I just call it silence. So I steal those silent moments. And sometimes silence can mean that there's a little bit of noise in the background, but it's as best as is possible for me. I try to still everything so that I can, so that I can hear myself. You said that in you know trying to be more and more spiritual, I might have not got it completely right. Mm -hmm. uh, you thought that you had to cut off from the stories, mm -hmm. that you should empty the stories to really, mm -hmm. and then you wake up the morning, look at yourself in the mirror, and there's your face. So obviously there's a story. Yeah. Tell us about that one. Why did you think that to be in a deep spiritual connection, mm -hmm. you had to cut off the story? Well, I don't know if cut off would be the term that I would use because it's impossible. You know, I think part of what is really exciting about this new sort of evolutionary movement and conversation that all of us are a part of is that the story can be included in the consciousness. So the part of me that is very much about not attempting to label everything as right and wrong, just what works in the context of what we're attempting to make work or um, what is suitable for the moment or what is appropriate now or what hurts my ankle. It's not that you know, the floor is bad because I tripped, it's just that I tripped. And there's, so sort of bringing this neutrality to everything takes us out of this concrete, painful, um, you know, the Buddhists would call it samsara, so this kind of suffering that is part of the dualistic existence that we have here. But letting that story be what it is, I'll let myself be Alanis from Ottawa, Canada, who lived in Germany for three years and moved around yes, the planet. Yes, she lived, she lived in Germany as a, as a baby <laughs> in Schwarzwald, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah. Have you ever, have you any remembrance of that time? Oh yeah, lots oh, of German do? flashbacks. <laughs> you have German flashbacks? What yeah. did they look like? <laughs> they look schnitzel ridden. <laughs> schnitzel ridden? <laughs> no, it's great. It's, uh, I have a lot of memories from when I lived in Germany, but that's part of the story, right? So if I didn't have that to access, there would be no art. You know, part of an artist's vocation, I think, in my opinion, is, is to comment on the story. What else can we comment on? I can't comment on someone else's story unless it's through my lens and through my filter. You know, we have a personal egoic eye so that we can comment and we can create, and that's part of what's fun about being here. But for me not to ever forget what the truth of my being is, which is not subject to this dualism, you know, and that's part of the spiritual practice. I have a lot of amazing teachers in my life and spiritual readings that I read that really remind me when I get too stuck in my story, and that happens a lot. Wow. Wow. Um, a very close of a friend of our family and a fabulous uh, author, poet, Peter Handke, um, who has really written, like you would say, hits, in book form, mm -hmm. uh, said, oh, if there's one thing he really would love to do once in his life, which he's never going to do, it would be to write a hit song, just something that goes straight to the heart of the people, where, you know, you turn it on and boom, there you are in this different mood and this, how does it feel to see people like, you know, just, you know that when they turn on the song, there's some, many th songs uh, of yours where, you know, I just turn it on, it puts me in a very, very unique mood. How, I mean, this is the most wonderful thing to be able to do, to create a hit song. How does it feel? It feels amazing to write a song that, that people can make their own. And I think it's important to note that I write these songs for myself. So I don't write songs for other people. It's the sharing of the songs secondarily that becomes the service. The first part is very indulgent, very um, cathartic, and very inquiry. It's just self-inquiry, which is part of my spiritual practice. The second aspect is sharing it publicly and then using the God-given talents that I have of my voice and my musicality. Um, so using our gifts combined with really having this self-knowledge to thine own self be true and self-knowledge is so empowering and is my spiritual practice. And then the second part is, is where I feel more grown up perhaps than I was when I was 16, just writing for myself and who cares. It became very vocational and, and then offering these songs to other people and we all have our own unique spark of what we're here to contribute. And some of it is very small and some of it is very large, but I don't think spirit cares about what form it takes. So, yeah. um, 
I would love to talk on and on with you, and I think the audience would love to listen <laughs> yeah, to you for much so longer. Fun. Just a last uh, question. Um, my dear friend Ursula asked yesterday in a little panel about creativity they uh, wow. had. She asked the three artists that were uh, there if she would have to write on a mirror where people would look at every morning. You know, what is the most important thing in life? What would you write? I just quote what they said. It was interesting because the first one said, be conscious. Mm -hmm. The next one said, you're allowed to do everything. And the third one said, take action. And I think it's a, it's a fabulous, like, it's nearly everything in. Is there something you would like to add for the people? Like, every day, think of, write this one motto, sentence. Oh, I would just say... Uh Hello, sweet little piece of God. How you doing? <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> like this beautiful sentence from the Bible. Your, your God, beloved child, in, which, in whom he's very pleased. And I definitely think this is what we all more than ever think of Alanis Morissette. Yeah. Before the very end, is there anything you would like to share with the audience? Just, I'm so happy to be here and thank you for having me. I feel very honored. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Temple up sound, it was bad. Huh? Last week, sing. Um, not Temple up.